so you see we are uh, we are looking at uh, compactness of families of uh, uh, functions okay we want to look at meromorphic functions all right and so you know uh, uh, what we did last time was montel's theorem okay uh, which is which was for analytic functions all right so so let me let me recall some recall this so that i'll i'll give you uh, uh, the background uh, for, for the formulation of uh, the version of Montel's theorem for meromorphic functions, which goes by the name of Marty's theorem. Okay, uh, and and once you have that, then uh, we can go ahead and try to get we we get closer to the proof of the Picard theorems. All right, so uh, so you see, uh, so you know, so you can recall. Uh, so maybe I'll put the title as Marty's theorem. So let me put here version of uh, uh, Montel theorem for meromorphic functions. So let's recall. See the uh, so uh, so the idea is the following. Uh, so you have D inside the complex plane. It's a domain. It's an open connected set, uh, non-empty of course. Okay, and you have uh, uh, script F is a family of uh, analytic functions on D. So this is uh, this is a subset of uh, holomorphic functions. Uh, on D, okay, and mind you, uh, uh, th these are of course uh, certainly uh, continuous functions on D uh, with complex values, right? So you have this family of holomorphic functions on D, and then <coughs> uh, the whole idea is uh, 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 you want to worry about the compactness of this family of functions, okay? And compactness in what sense? Compactness uh, can be, you know. Uh, in, gen in, in, in general, uh, compactness is uh, the same as sequential compactness, okay, uh, as a general philosophy, and so, uh, uh, and you should expect. Therefore, you want conditions for which, given a sequence of funct uh, functions in F in the family script F, you want to pick a, pick out a convergent subsequence. Okay, now uh, uh, the the point is that. Uh, you know, um, of course, uh, 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 since you are working with holomorphic functions, okay, uh, just convergence is not a very useful thing. Uh, you you will you you would like to have a kind of convergence that will preserve properties of the original functions, uh, uh, which are converging to the limit function, and therefore. Uh, uh, the best uh, kind of convergence you can expect is uniform convergence, but of course uniform convergence is too much to expect. What you will normally get is only normal convergence. Okay, that is you will get uniform convergence restricted only to compact subsets, right? So it's so it, that is the background, and uh, so what is it that you have? See, uh, so on the one hand, uh, you want f is uh, uh, normally sequentially compact. Uh, and what do I mean by this? I mean that, given any sequence in F, I can find I, I can find a, a subsequence which uh, converges normally. That means which converges uniformly on compact subsets. Okay. So let me write that uh, uh, any uh, sequence in F uh, admits a subsequence. That converges uh, uh, uniformly on compact subsets on compact subsets of D. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is compactness for us. Okay, that and 
uh, that that given any uh, sequence you can extract a convergence of sequence but the convergence is only with respect to normal convergence okay so this is what you want now how do you uh, uh, what what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, for this to happen what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for this to happen so you know if you want to go from uh, uh, from here to here if you want to go from here to here all right uh, uh, so you will get immediately that uh, uh, f is normally uniformly bounded okay so that 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 means that you uh, given this family of functions in script f and if you restrict it to any compact set then that family will have a uniform bound so there is some positive number such that the modulus of the functions is bounded by that number and this will work for all functions and for all points on that compact set okay so uh, so this is so this is something that you will get and the other thing you will get is you will also get that f is the, the family is equicontinuous okay so uh, plus so so let me write this uh, f is uh, so so for some reason um, i let me write it at, at a distance so i'll write here uh, f is equicontinuous so um, how does how does this come uh, th this these two implications come because of the they basically come because of the rsl ascoli theorem okay so this is so let me write this as let me put a a here where you know i will put a a here also where uh, uh, let me write here as a legend a a stands for arzel ascoli you know this is just the arzel ascoli theorem see what arzel ascoli theorem says is that you know if you are looking at continuous complex or real valued functions on a compact metric space okay uh, then uh, the condition that uh, uh, you, uh, such a family of functions is uh, compact okay is equivalent to that family of functions being uh, uh, uniformly bounded and uh, equicontinuous that is arzel ascoli theorem so uh, if you now look at it uh, if you now look at this uh, thing that i have assumed on the this property on the left side which says that uh, this family um, is sequentially compact uh, if I restrict to any compact subset okay so if I take capital K a compact subset of D and I restrict this family to that okay uh, then I am looking at a family of uh, continuous functions on a compact metric space okay uh, any compact subset of D is also a metric space it is a compact metric space the metric is just the metric on D uh, restricted to that subset okay and uh, then by the Arzel Ascoli theorem uh, that the family script f will become actually compact uh, you know uh, with respect to the topology given by the supremum norm okay uh, the 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 supremum norm uh, is 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 defined and uh, you have the metric induced by that norm and the topology induced by the metric so with respect to that this uh, this family script f actually becomes a compact family okay uh, it becomes a co compact subset of points okay and you are now considering this family inside uh, uh, c uh, k uh, c k c namely the set of all continuous uh, functions on the compact set k with values in c okay of course because analytic functions are of course uh, i mean of course continuous okay so uh, then by the arzel ascoli theorem what will happen is that on on uh, that compact set k uh, what will happen is that this family will be uh, uniformly bounded okay that is bounded with respect to the sup norm right which is uniform boundedness and you will get equicontinuity so uh, and and since this uh, an equicontinuity is something that is uh, needs to be checked at every point so uh, you will get equicontinuity for the family the whole family throughout all of d okay to check equicontinuity at all of d uh, at every point of d i just have to check equicontinuity at each point of d and to check at each point of d it is enough to check on each compact subset of d 
even a point is a compact subset if you want okay. Uh, so uh, equicontinuity will follow and restricted to that compact subset I also have uniform boundedness okay. Therefore uh, restricted to compact subsets I have uniform boundedness and that is normal uniform boundedness. So that is how I get these two implications okay. But uh, the serious thing is to go uh, so that, that uh, the serious thing is to go the other way around okay. So starting with uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, you know the Arzee Laskali theorem uh, in, in another direction tells you that if you are on a compact metric space uh, and you are looking at continuous functions complex valued or real valued if you know the these, this collection of functions is uh, uniformly bounded and it is equicontinuous then your family is uh, is compact okay. Now uh, so if I start go from this direction suppose I assume uh, f is uh, normally uniformly bounded script f, f is normally uniformly bounded namely this condition. So uh, I will purposely uh, change color because I want to emphasize something else. Uh, so you, you know I take this I take this condition that a script f is normally uniformly bounded all right. Then the beautiful thing is I do not have to add equicontinuity that is the big deal. The big deal is you can go from here to here directly uh, as a theorem and this is the this is Montel's theorem. So this is Montel's theorem that is you start with uh, 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 a normally uniformly bounded family of uh, analytic functions okay then it is uh, then it is normally sequentially compact that means you can given uh, given uh, yes sequence you can extract a subsequence which converges normally all right and mind you the so I have I have to tell you a few things here this is this Montel theorem is stronger than Arzela Ascoli okay in the following sense see what Arzela Ascoli theorem will say is that you know if you restrict yourself to a compact subset of D if you take one compact if you take a particular compact subset of D okay and suppose I have this condition that this family script F is normally uniformly bounded then this family script F will become uniformly bounded on that compact subset. And again I will get equicontinuity and I will apply the Arzela Ascoli theorem and I will be able to pick a subsequence which converges uniformly on that compact subset okay. And the uh, uh, the of course equicontinuity comes because of the derivatives being bounded which comes as a result of the Cauchy integral formulas and some estimations okay and, and the Cauchy estimates of the first derivative okay. But let us forget that for the moment basically what happens is you are able to for every compact subset if I start with the sequence uh, in the family f for every compact subset I am able to get a convergent subsequence. So I am able to pick a subsequence such that on that compact subset the convergence is uniform. But the point is if I change the compact subset the subsequence can change okay if I apply only the Arzela Ascoli theorem if I change the compact subset then the subsequence can change but the Montel theorem is very strong what it says is that I can uniformly find a single subsequence of the original sequence which will converge uniformly on every compact subset it will work for every compact subset okay that is the strong that is this that is the power in the Montel theorem and if you remember we we got this by a diagonalization argument okay we covered the domain D by an increasing sequence of compact sets okay which fill out the domain and on each seek on each uh, member of this sequence of compact sets we picked out a convergent subsequence using Arzela Ascoli theorem okay and then we wrote down this matrix of uh, uh, convergent uh, subsequences uh, by you know uh, for the first uh, compact set uh, in the sequence we picked out a subsequent uh, in the sequence of uh, sets covering the space D uh, we picked out one sequence from the original sequence we, from Arzela Ascoli okay. Then from this sequence we picked out another subsequence which will work on the next bigger compact subset okay and then we went on like this and all these compact subsets eventually filled their union filled the whole of D okay 
and the diagonal sequence uh, gave us a sequence of the original sequence which will converge uh, uniformly on every compact subset of D because every compact subset of D uh, is contained in one of the members of this sequence of uh, compact sets that we increasing sequence of compact sets that we constructed to cover D. Okay. So, you see we got this very strong power uh, strong statement uh, from Montauk theorem. Okay. So, that is one point you have to remember. Okay. And the other important point about Montauk's theorem is that you do not worry about you really do not worry about equicontinuity. Okay. And this is basically because you are working with analytic function. So, what is happening is that uh, this uh, this condition that the that the uh, that the family is normally uniformly bounded tells you that if you take the family of derivatives of these functions then that family of derivatives is also uniform normally uniformly bounded okay and so so let me write this uh, so i'll write this uh, as f prime is normally uniformly bounded so there is this there is this thing here in between uh, okay so when i write of course when i write f prime i mean the set of all i, I mean all those derivatives of functions f which are in small f which are in script f okay so uh, so script f prime is just the derivatives of functions in script f okay and mind you the functions in script f are all analytic therefore the derivatives you know if you take a function which is analytic then all orders of derivatives of that function exist and they are also analytic okay so script f prime is also a bona fide family of holomorphic functions on the same domain okay and the point is that that is normally uniformly bounded okay and 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 that is because that is simply because of the fact that the derivative of a function can be expressed in terms of the function using the cauchy integral formula okay and therefore if the original functions are uniformly bounded then the derivatives are also uniformly bounded on closed uh, on sufficiently small closed disks okay so moral the moral of the story story is that the derivatives are normally uniformly bounded and because the derivatives are normally uniformly bounded uh, you know this is a philosophy that i told you last time uh, whenever the derivatives are bounded uniformly then the original family is equally continuous okay because you just have to integrate okay so this so there is another implication that is going like this whenever the derivatives uh, whenever the family of derivatives is unif uniformly bounded then the original family is equally continuous so what happens is that because i assume that the family is normally uniformly bounded i am also getting equal continuity the way I am getting equicontinuity is because I am getting actually normal uniform boundedness of the family of derivatives that is the whole point and the reason I am able to get this is because of the Cauchy integral formula because of the Cauchy estimates okay. So this is how this is how everything works now what is it that uh, 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 so what is it that uh, you we want to do with meromorphic functions okay. So, if you now if you are uh, you see so far we are working here in the in the in the set of all holomorphic functions I mean analytic functions all right but you know you want to work with meromorphic functions. The problem with that is that if you are working with meromorphic functions then you are going to allow the value infinity okay. So, you are going to take values not uh, if you are if you are going to take a meromorphic function uh, uh, you cannot just uh, consider it as a function into complex numbers because then at a pole uh, you cannot define it whereas if you consider it as a function into the uh, extended complex plane okay then at a pole you can define the function value to be infinity and still keep the function continuous even at a pole okay. So if you are working with meromorphic functions uh, you want to do the same you want to have a, the same kind of theorem okay then you know it is a little uh, it is a little troublesome uh, somehow you can see that uh, in this whole game you have to pass through this uh, this red box that I have put here which is that the derivatives are normally uniformly bounded okay and, and that see 
will work for analytic functions uh, as it is will not work for metamorphic functions because uh, uh, the problem will be at the poles at a pole I cannot I cannot apply any kind of Cauchy integral formula uh, I cannot express in fact even derivative at a pole is not defined it is a singular point okay so I am in trouble and you know in order to overcome this we had introduced this concept of spherical derivative okay so that is what we are going to use so in fact we will get this uh, 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 theorem that now you again take a domain in the complex plane you take a family of hol uh, not holomorphic but meromorphic functions on the domain but mind you you are now considering this as functions not into the complex plane but functions into the extended complex plane okay and when you consider it as functions into the extended complex plane mind you the target space is not compl uh, the complex plane it is the extended complex plane and the extended complex plane has been made into a metric space by putting the spherical metric and with respect to the spherical metric it is a compact metric space it is a beautiful metric space it is just the Riemann sphere with the spherical metric on that okay all right and now what you do is you get this version of the Montel uh, the correct version of Montel's theorem for meromorphic functions which will tell you that now you again take a family of meromorphic functions the condition that uh, uh, it is uh, normally sequentially compact is equivalent to saying that the spherical derivatives are bounded that is it okay. So what I want you to understand is that uh, it is it's, it's rather uh, funny when you move from uh, the holomorphic version of the Montel theorem to the uh, meromorphic version of the Montel theorem which is called Matisse theorem okay you your condition uh, changes from the normal boundedness of the uh, of the family of functions to the normal boundedness of the derivatives but what derivatives spherical derivatives that is the big change okay and, and with that the everything works okay so that is what I am going to state next so so here is so here is Martin's theorem let D uh, in C be a domain of course uh, non empty as usual uh, and uh, script F is a family of uh, meromorphic functions on D okay mind you uh, this is a subspace of the continuous functions on D with values in the extended complex plane okay you have to remember this this is very very important we are considering meromorphic when you say meromorphic function you are allowing the value infinity okay otherwise you will not get con continuity at the pole at poles okay that is very very important okay then uh, F is uh, sequentially is not normally sequentially compact compact ie every sequence in script f uh, in script f uh, admits uh, uh, subsequence that converges uh, uniformly normally that is uniformly on compact subsets of D if and only if uh, the so I will write f hash what is f hash this is the collection of spherical derivatives of the functions in f so we use prime for derivative when it is an analytic function when it is not an analytic function but it is a meromorphic function we use hash okay which is the which is the notation we introduced earlier so this is a set of all f hash such that f belongs to script f is normally uniformly bounded that is uniformly bounded on on 
compact substance. So, this is Monte's theorem. So, this is a this is the meromorphic version of Monte's theorem, meromorphic version of Monte's theorem. So, le, le, let me write that here. And 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 the big deal in this statement is uh, essentially to say uh, uh, that instead of requiring that the original family of functions is normally uniformly bounded, which is what the original Montel theorem want, want you know needed, you shift to the uh, spherical derivatives of those functions, that is the difference. Okay. Now, you see uh, what does this say in retrospect? I mean what it says in retrospect is that in, in, in principle it says that if you take a family of even if you take a family of analytic functions okay, even if you take a family of analytic functions the condition that uh, the, uh, the usual derivatives are normally bound uniformly bounded is also equivalent to the, uh, the sequ normal sequential compactness of the family. Okay. That is the big deal. The big deal is you know if you go back to this uh, uh, diagram, okay, we had this uh, we had this red box here which said uh, that the derivatives, the usual derivatives which in this case are uh, they make sense because the functions are analytic, the usual derivatives are normally uniformly bounded. They are uniformly bounded on compact subsets. Okay. Now, this itself uh, this itself uh, is good enough uh, to give you normal sequential compactness. Okay. But there is only there is only one small issue uh, since the compactness is uh, I mean since the convergence is with respect to uh, 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 functions which can take the value infinity the convergence the point wise convergence is with respect to the spherical metric that is the difference. Okay. So, what it means is it means the following suppose I have a family of analytic functions on a domain how do I decide that this family is, is compact okay. that is it is normally sequentially compact. One direct way is use the usual Montel theorem which will for which I need all the functions uh, in the family to be normally uniformly bounded to be I must be able to find a uniform bound for this family on every compact subset. There is another way the other way is I verify that the derivatives the family of derivatives of these functions that is normally uniformly bounded. If you verify that okay, then what happens because of this uh, meromorphic version of uh, uh, Montel's theorem that family of uh, uh, see if the usual uh, derivatives are uh, uh, nor, uh, are, uh, are uniformly bounded on a set then the spherical derivatives will also be uniformly bounded on the set. Okay. That is because of the way in which the spherical derivatives are defined. See how is the spherical derivative defined? See it is defined like this. Uh, so, uh, for, for uh, f uh, uh, meromorphic function uh, recall that uh, uh, the spherical derivative of f at z you know it is defined as 2 times mod uh, 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 f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod f z the whole square. This is the definition of spherical derivative. This is how the spherical deriva derivative is defined. Okay. This is how we define the spherical derivative and of course you know you, there is there is an issue I have used uh, 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 mod f dash in the numerator that makes sense only if f dash exists and therefore I can write this only at points z which are not poles, but at poles what happens at poles you know we did this in an earlier lecture at poles you extend the spherical derivative by continuity and what happens is that the spherical derivative will become 0 at a pole of higher order okay, and at a pole of order 1 namely at a simple 
pole, the spherical derivative is 2 divided by the modulus of the residue of the function at that pole, okay. So, therefore, this, uh, uh, so in particular, you know, if you look at it in a very uh, 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 logical kind of way, uh, uh, even if you take the function which is identically infinity, okay, mind you that function also is there in our space now, because we are considering functions with, uh, uh, you know, values possibly being infinity also. If you take the function which is always infinity, that function is also by definition a f a for a one for which you have to define the spherical derivative and the spher spherical derivative will be 0, okay. So, this is something that we, uh, we, may, we make as a default definition, okay. And this, so I am just trying to say if you take the function which is u uniformly infinity, which is infinity at every point on your domain, that function is also included and that function also uh, its spherical derivative is also included, the spherical derivative is 0. The way you think about it is, is, is that you know uh, usually the derivative should be 0 if the function is constant. After all the function which is infinity at every point is just the constant function infinity. So, you should expect the derivative to be 0 that is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is what is the spherical derivative? If you take a meromorphic function you treat it as a map into the Riemann sphere okay and what it does is it is the magnification factor of the length uh, of uh, the image i mean it is it is a magnification factor that you will have to put in to calculate the uh, length of the image of an arc under this mapping so suppose you have an arc on the suppose you have a suppose you have a an arc a contour on the complex plane in your domain where your meromorphic function is defined okay and uh, you take its image uh, under this meromorphic function, it will land on the Riemann sphere where I am thinking of the extended complex plane as a Riemann sphere. So, I am going to get an arc on the Riemann sphere. Of course, this arc, arc can pass through infinity. It will pass through infinity if the original arc in the plane pass through some poles of your meromorphic function. Wherever the original arc in your complex plane hit a pole, uh, the image will hit the north pole on the Riemann sphere which corresponds to the point at infinity. Okay. And if you take the image arc, how do you get the length of the image arc? What you will do is you will integrate the, the meromorphic function, uh, the, not the meromorphic function, in fact you will integrate its spherical derivative along the original arc and you will get the length of the image arc. So, the spherical derivative is a magnification factor okay. and if this and if your original function is just the function which is constant function infinity, then it is going to map your whole domain onto a point. Okay. If you take the function which is constant function infinity, then your whole domain is going to be collapsed to the point which corresponds to the north pole. So, any arc is going to be collapsed to a single point. Okay. So, what is the magnification factor? 0 and that should be the spherical derivative. So, this is another way of saying that you know if you take a, uh, if you take the constant function infinity, you must think of the spherical derivative of that to be 0. Okay. That is another point that you will have to remember in mind. So, but in any case the spherical derivative as it is, is always a continuous function and that is the reason why we are able to integrate, uh, integrate it always. Even if your uh, path of integration passes through some poles of f, that is very very serious, okay. But anyway, what you see from here is that because there is this mod f dash uh, term here, okay, what it will tell you is that if you are looking at a family of analytic functions whose derivatives are normally uniformly bounded, okay. Then these numerators are normally uniformly bounded, okay. But then you know uh, I can forget the factor 1 plus mod fz squared in the denominator, okay, because that is a that is a uh, that is a factor greater than or equal to 1 and its reciprocal is less than or equal to 1. So, actually I you know I can write f hash of z is actually uh, is less than or equal to 2 mod f dash of z. I can write this, this makes sense, okay, because the, the denominator, uh, I can forget the denominator, okay. And what does this tell you? This tells you that whenever f dash is defined, okay, for partic in particular if you are looking at a family of analytic functions, okay, and the derivatives are, makes sense. Then if you know the derivatives are bounded, then it means that the spherical derivatives are bounded, because the spherical derivative is bounded by 2 times the uh, uh, bound for the usual derivatives. So, if you start 
with the family variety functions such that the, uh, 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 the derivatives are bounded, then the spherical derivatives are bounded and Marti's theorem will tell you that these family of analytic functions considered as a family of meromorphic functions, mind you analytic functions are also meromorphic functions, but when you consider it as a family of meromorphic functions you are allowing the value infinity. With that consideration this family becomes uh, sequentially normally sequentially compact that means given any sequence you can get hold of a uh, uh, subsequence which converges normally. So finally what happens is that uh, this box that I wrote down here is the crucial uh, is, the, is, the, is the crucial condition that is crucial for both the original uh, Montel theorem and also the uh, the meromorphic version of Montel's theorem which is Marty's theorem. So this is the crucial thing, the boundedness of the derivatives, okay. So uh, but the only, the only thing that can happen is that your uh, sequence of analytic functions may go to infinity because that is allowed now, okay. See if you go back and think we proved the following thing, you take a sequence of analytic functions on a domain okay a if you if you take convergence with respect to the spherical metric either they will converge to an analytic function or they will converge to the function which is identical infinity okay and the same kind of thing happens with meromorphic functions you take a you take a sequence of meromorphic functions which converges normally on a domain okay then either the limit is a meromorphic function or it is the function which is uh, you know identically infinity you don't get you don't get bad behavior you don't get a sequence of holomorphic functions or analytic functions going to a function which is meromorphic strictly meromorphic or you do not get a sequence of meromorphic functions which goes to a function which has funny singularities namely it may have non isolated singularities or it may have isolated essential singularities such these kind of horrible things do not happen okay. So if you take this thing that I have put down uh, uh, which I have now rounded in a in a in, a, in an uh, oblong uh, ellipse as the important condition okay then that is uh, the condition for uh, sequential compactness that is what I want to say and see this condition works if the functions are analytic okay and the analogous condition namely the derivatives replaced by the spherical derivatives that works if the functions are meromorphic okay. So, the, so this is uh, I mean this is the this is a very very important point in our theory that we have finally managed to translate uh, compactness of a family of uh, uh, meromorphic functions or analytic functions to just uniform boundedness of derivatives that is all okay and you if they are usual analytic functions use the usual derivatives if they are meromorphic functions use the spherical derivatives that is all okay. So bringing in the derivatives is the big deal here okay. So we will now we will now need to see a, a, a look at a proof of uh, this theorem and uh, the proof is pretty easy except that you will have to worry about all these issues uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are little little things that need to be checked okay. So, uh, so I will I'll, I'll, I'll try to write down the proof uh, pretty uh, in pretty uh, short steps and I uh, will ask you to do some small verifications. So let me write the uh, so let me say the following thing um, uh, so you see uh, let me write the uh, so uh, so here is what I have to prove I have a domain in the complex plane I have a family of meromorphic functions uh, I assume if I, I have to assume first that the family is normally sequentially compact and I have to show that the spherical derivatives are bounded okay uh, normally uniformly bounded and I have to do the other way out and uh, uh, what do I uh, what do what does the proof actually involve it involves a few simple results. Uh, uh, so, um, so let me write this. So here are a few lemmas uh, that I want to worry about, um, or rather, let me put, let me say lemma. Uh, if uh, a sequence f k of meromorphic functions converges to f, okay, in uh, M D then the same thing happens to the sequence of spherical derivatives ok. 
okay. Uh, of course, uh, uh, here uh, again I must, uh, so I have written it in very very simple words but I must again insist when I say converges, I mean converges normally, okay. It means it is uniform on compact subsets. So if fk is a sequence of meromorphic functions on D, it converges uniformly on compact subsets to a function f. We have already seen that this f can either be meromorphic or it can be the function which is identically infinity that we have already seen. Then this normal convergence preserves derivatives okay. So this is something that we have seen also with analytic functions. If a sequence of analytic functions converges normally to a given function then the limit function is also analytic and you know you can uh, the, the, the nth order derivatives of the original sequence of functions will converge normally to the nth order derivative of the limit function and this is all just because of normal convergence, uniform convergence on compact subsets okay. So uh, the same thing happens with spherical derivatives, this is one fact that we will have to use okay. So uh, you, you can check this and um, well uh, if you want to go back to the uh, uh, let, let me let me tell you about the uh, let me tell you at least in words about the proof of this theorem yeah at least one way is very clear okay so I uh, suppose uh, your family is normally sequentially compact okay and suppose uh, contrary to what is required the uh, family of derivatives spherical derivatives is not normally uh, uniformly bounded then you know there is a compact subset on which these derivatives will go to infinity okay and so this there is a compact subset and a sequence of functions where the spherical derivatives will go to infinity okay that is that is what you get if you contradict uh, norm, uh, normal uniform boundedness okay of the spherical derivatives. But if that happens then the original family could not have been normal because if the original family were normal then what would happen? is that the original from every sequence you can pick out a normally convergent subsequence if the if the if the subsequence is normally convergent then the spherical derivatives is also normally convergent okay but then we have already obtained a sequence uh, of spherical derivatives uh, which doesn't converge okay so uh, the, the, the point you will have to uh, remember here is that when you are considering spherical derivatives the convergence is with, with respect to the usual distance function on the real line okay mind you that is another important point. The spherical derivative is a positive non-negative real valued function okay and whenever you talk about convergence of the spherical derivatives you are working with uh, convergence on the real line that is something that you should not forget okay and therefore you get a contradiction. So uh, this is one way of the theorem, the, the other way I will prove in the next lecture.